Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you uh, to our second Beyond Clean Myth Busting panel discussion from right here, right here at the 2019 Ish Emanuel Conference and Expo. Um, we had a really great event last year. We're really excited to do it again this year, and I hope you all have been enjoying a couple of full days of networking and learning uh, here in Anaheim. Uh, I'm Justin Poulin. I'm founder and CEO of Beyond Clean. And when we began recording the podcast nearly two years ago, we really didn't anticipate just the enormous and positive response that we've received for this entire, uh, from the entire industry for this project. We're grateful uh, to all the contributors, and I know there are many of you in this room or sitting up on the panel today that have really helped us out, uh, out along the way. The podcast has been downloaded in more than 130 countries to date, all the, uh, all the way across the globe, and listeners can now earn continuing education credits when they listen to our podcast, which we feel like is filling a huge need in the industry. Beyond Clean is also growing rapidly. We've added a full suite of consulting services that includes joint commission preparation, department assessments, CSPD manager mentorship programs, interim management, and a prestigious speakers bureau. Many of you already know Hank Balch, our founder and president, as well as Mike Matthews, our VP of Analytics and Resource Development, but we're proud to announce three new members of our leadership team who have joined our mission to educate, inspire, and engage sterile processing professionals around the globe as we fight dirty. Uh, first, Dr. Peter Nickel. He will be serving as our Chief Medical Officer, um, and Bob Mars, who recently was just awarded the Isham Award of Honor yesterday morning at the uh, opening ceremonies. <laughs> very, very proud to have you aboard, Bob. Thank you. Um, he will lead us as the Vice President of Organizational Development. And then just recently, uh, we made yet another announcement, a man that needs no introduction. Chuck Hughes will be serving with Beyond Clean as an Executive Advisor. So each of these additions to the Beyond Clean leadership team are widely recognized as gifted presenters who share our passion for education. It's at the core of what we do here at Beyond Clean. Finally, we want to thank all of you who have contributed to our success, especially the ones in the room who are avid listeners, a past guest, or a vendor who has sponsored the podcast. With that in mind, we'd like to take a moment and recognize anyone in attendance who's been featured on an episode of Beyond Clean. If you'd please stand so that we can recognize your contributions to the podcast. Um, we're sponsored by Ultra Clean Systems, um, and the whole myth-busting event is being produced this evening. So Tom is the marketing director and past podcast guest on Beyond Clean. He'll be filming. And in 1999, Ultra Clean Systems was the first to design a cleaning system to clean 12 lumen instruments at a time. Currently, Ultra Clean manufactures the Triton 72 that cleans up to 72 lumens in a single cycle and all Da Vinci robotic platforms, including, including the new single port system robotics. Ultra Clean Systems also publishes New Splash, which is a free um, which is a free digital newsletter dedicated to providing useful information to sterile processing and infection prevention professionals. With minimal advertising, News Splash covers a variety of interesting topics on new medical techno technological advancements and features and a new relevant article every single week by contributing writers such as Jonathan Wilder, Rose Seavey, Sean Flynn, Sarah Freiberg, and our own Hank Balch. The newsletter provides information on Isham chapter and national meetings, other conferences and events, as well as links to CE credits courses. Each week, a, a new issue features a profound quote, perfect for leaders that want to make a difference. And in recent years, there has been a great deal of discussion regarding sterility assurance, such as managing recalls and the push for every load monitoring, which has resulted in what we refer to as the biological indicator uh, speed wars. The purpose of tonight's event is to bring various perspectives on sterility assurance from across the globe to engage in a moderated panel discussion and attempt to answer many of the questions that CSPD professionals have on their minds every day. The modalities re represented on the panel include parametric release, biological indicators, and chemical monitoring. 
I am thrilled to introduce our expert panelist for the evening's discussion, Renee Vies from Steel Co. Benelux. <laughs> Kelly Soto Pacheco from the Steris Corporation. <laughs> and Mike Eckenweiler from Medline Industries. I would also now encourage you to review the trifold that we provided, which includes full biographies for all of the panelists and details their extensive experience in the medical industry. And now we will begin our panel discussion entitled Sterility Assurance Myth Busting. Panelists will be timed. I will hold up a card to make them aware as time begins to expire, and the time limit will be noted by the ringing of a bell, at which time the panelists are expected to finish succinctly and allow for the next question. Excellent. Thank you, Justin. Uh, we will now begin with the panel discussion. Uh, our first section is the section we call the warm-up. Uh, during this time, we will ask each uh, panelist to uh, provide a brief description of your modality, and we would ask you to answer what uh, would you say is the biggest myth in the industry related to sterility assurance. We will begin with parametric uh, validation viewpoint. You have four minutes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think uh, the biggest myth is that steam sterilization is easy. You just put steam in a sterilizer and you put your instruments in and everything is fine. Um, my modality or where I come from has been shown in the folder. I, I was also a, a SPD manager for 25 years. I did a lot of validation of sterilizers um, and I've seen some shocking things while doing proper parametric uh, release and validation. Um, the other thing is that you think that every load and every instrument and every configuration that you put in your sterilizer is, um, is the same and is, is reacts and responds in the same way as you would expect from the previous load. That is unfortunately not the case. And uh, one of the things that you can see uh, while uh, parametric release is measuring the parameters of your sterilization uh, uh, cycle. When you take uh, temperature measurements of your in individual instrument, you see that your instruments have different temperature profiles. So you have to have a, uh, a good understanding of your loads, of your instruments, of your products that you want to sterilize. You have a good um, understanding of your loading patterns because that can be, have a, di a big effect on your uh, sterility assurance. But mostly, you need to know, I'm very sorry. No, sorry. Shall I start over? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the, the one thing you need to know is you have, need to know your parameters. If you don't know your parameters of your sterilization cycle, um, that is, uh, uh, yeah, then you're just measuring the outcome, the door opens, the green light is on, and that's, maybe not the case. So, um, as we all know, uh, st steam sterilization is based upon a specific time for a specific temperature with saturated steam. Do we know these parameters? Do we measure these parameters? Uh, and the, the recorder says something, but where is your thermocouple? The thermocouple is in the drain. It's not on an instrument. So, do you know your, the quality of your steam? Are there non-condensable gases in your steam? Is your clean pure enough? All these things uh, have a big effect on your sterilization, uh, sterility assurance. So I think that if you, if you don't measure the, the parameters or the, uh, and, and the individual things that happen in your sterilizer, it is almost impossible to tell if the load will be sterile. I understand you cannot do that for every cycle every day but you have to have a good understanding of your critical parameters. Even if you bring in uh, a new trace, right? like uh, whatever, you get a new set of loaners, these instruments you have never seen before. So how do you make sure that those instruments are being properly sterilized? Um, you know uh, from experience that metal heats up in a different way than plastics. So you need to know what happens with those instruments. So you need to validate 
these particular loads, or at least representative instruments. Um, I think that um, if you if you look at, at the parameters and if you if you do your normal cycle check, you, you get a little printout, and uh, it says temperature and pressure. There is another thing that you need to know, and it is temperature and pressure might be related on paper, but might not be related if you have non-condensable gases. Thank you. Same question, biological indicators. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. I'm going to give you a quick little bit of background on me. Um, I've been a microbiologist for 18 years now, and I've been at Steris for about 13. Um, I've touched a little bit of everything at Steris. Um, liquid chemical processing systems and spore strips, um, sporicidal chemistries, disinfectants. I've done chemical indicator validation um, in steam and vaporous hydrogen peroxide processes, but mainly I've been focused on developing biological indicators. Um, and biological indicators are test systems containing a spore-forming microorganism. And these microorganisms are highly resistant to the process that we're measuring. Um, originally, these spore-forming organisms were found in like canned vegetables, like canned corn, because they were surviving the, um, the processing conditions in these canning facilities that are extreme conditions that these um, cans are being processed under. And these spores were surviving these processes. So they've become really well studied since then, really well characterized as sterility assurance monitors because they were so resistant. Um, there's some similarities between the spores. We use different spores depending on what modality we're monitoring, whether it's steam or vaporous hydrogen peroxide, but there are some similarities that make these spores so resistant. Um, they basically can desiccate or dehydrate themselves, um, and they can surround themselves with a very, very hard spore coat. So if it helps you to think about them, if you think about them like a seed, they can basically turn themselves into a seed under extreme conditions of heat or pressure or starvation, any kind of deprivation. Um, and they'll sit dormant, they're metabolically dormant until those conditions improve, until the temperature drops to a condition that they like, until the starvation ceases, whatever the condition is, um, and then they become active again. And so these, um, these spores have been studied again as to be so resistant. Um, most BIs contain Geobacillus sterothermophilus. It's a thermophilic organism, which means that it already likes very high temperatures. It already thrives at temperatures where most bacteria don't want to survive. So again, it adds another challenge. It adds another level of resistance to this spore. Uh, most of the BIs on the market are self-contained, meaning that they contain their own recovery media to evaluate the spore response. Um, and that spore response can be evaluated either by traditional growth in a growth um, supporting medium or now we have these faster BIs on the market that give us an enzyme-based readout um, from an incubator. I would say that the biggest myth in the industry is that all BIs are created equal. Um, ANSI Amy SDNet 79 says that you're supposed to use BIs for routine monitoring of your sterilization cycles. But it also says that healthcare personnel should select a BI that is suitable for use in that specific sterilization cycle per the BI manufacturer's instructions for use. So one BI SKU may not fit all of your sterilization scenarios. I mentioned we use different BIs for steam versus hydrogen peroxide versus maybe ethylene oxide, but I would encourage you to look within the same modalities, within the steam, for example. Um, you have pre-vacuum cycles and gravity cycles. They're very different. They were designed different for a reason. Um, we validate BIs for specific times and temperatures, and there's a wide variety of cycles out there. And again, there's, talking about these wide variety of cycles, there's different, um, different, different groups of cycles, immediate use, um, terminal sterilization, extended cycles. These all deserve a different biological monitor. Thank you. Same question, chemical indicators. Hey everybody, thanks for having me as well. Um, so I'll just give a brief description of a chemical indicator and then I'll go into some more detailed explanation. So it's essentially the combination of an indicator agent and its substrate that reveals a change in one or more variable. So those variables are time, temperature, and steam. Uh, and then it, and it basically reveals a change from the exposure to that process. So um, 
The chemical indicator line is, is a little bit uh, expansive because, as you know, we have anything varying from a type 1 that's just kind of a process indicator all the way down to like a type 6 that's going to give you a more targeted uh, focus on how that indicator, what that indicator is uncovering. So um, I think that where this chemical indicator stuff gets convoluted and, and where some of the myths come about is that we have ISO that recognizes types 1 through 6, we have AMI that has kind of class classifications, and then you start getting into the FDA that doesn't recognize the classifications whatsoever. And so uh, the, the development of some of, you know, the chaos in the chemi chemical indicator world is how do you know which one to use for which situation? And I think that um, kind of going to what, what Kelly said with BIs is that not all chemical indicators are created equal. They measure different things. How do you select which one to use, um, you know, and, and they all kind of have, a, for example, a Bowie Dick has its own classification and it's measuring one specific thing. You don't use that for routine monitoring. Uh, so, you know, what I would say is, 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 you know, understanding what each one is measuring and then measuring in those loads um, because we all also have, you know, there's, there's not just one standard, there's kind of standard loads, but then there's extended cycles and um, different temperatures based on the sterilizer that you have and things like that. So um, the chemical indicator world is almost, a, it creates its own myths because it's, it's got so many different types that you have to understand. Um, and so it can be fairly difficult because chemical indicators bring in more of the science side of it. And even the different manufacturers of chemical indicators have different science behind what they're measuring. So. Thank you very much. So panelists, this next session begins our targeted questions. I will ask each of you a question. You will have three minutes to reply. The original responder and then the other two panelists will then have 60 seconds to reply. And then the directed question will then, panelists will have 60 additional seconds to rebut the previous answers. So our first question is, Parametric release is used widely across Europe as the accepted means for sterility assurance. Why is this not a standard practice in the U.S.? And this is directed at parametric release. The why, um, I think, uh, basically, I don't know why. Let me say that. Why don't you do parametric release? But I understand where it comes from. It is, you, you have equipment that it might not be equipped with validation ports and other things that you have to have to do parametric release. On the other hand, um, parametric release does not, or maybe should not replace the BIs and the CIs. It is something extra. You measure the, the actual uh, conditions on an instrument. You can still do BIs and CIs, but I, uh, I, I think there is a, a from, from history point of view, there is a big use of BIs and CIs in the US. If I, if I look at Europe, uh, my country, the Netherlands, zero. Zero BIs only for uh, hydrogen peroxide. Um, we measure the sterilant, we measure the temperature and the time. So, the actual reason, I hope you can tell me, why uh, you will not adapt to that system. I'm not forcing you, I'm just telling you. I, I, I would, as a person, I would like to know what happens on my instrument or in my instrument and not in a BI and a CI. But that's just me. Eh? I understand that there is a market and a demand for these products. And uh, by, by the ISO standards, it's allowed to do that. It's allowed to do either or both, um, but that's what I think. Thank you. And then this same question is directed to biological indicators. Okay. Um, well, I think unlike in Europe, I think in the U.S. we follow the, the guidance of ANSI Amy ST79 um, to set up a sterility assurance program. And ST79 recommends that you use BIs for sterilizer qualification testing, for product testing, for routine sterilizer efficacy monitoring, preferably daily, and for load, load monitoring, including implant loads where a BI is required by the CDC. 
So I think that's why we, we use BIs and CIs still to some extent. Um, the, the products on the market today allow for really fast response time, so there's little to no downtime now before you can actual get, actually get a lethality response from your biological indicator. But I would argue that if you are working to set up these good quality control systems of sterility assurance, that you would use elements of parametric release along with your biological indicators and your chemical indicators, that you would evaluate your cycle tapes, and that you would monitor your sterilizer parameters and your sterilizer performance. Thank you. And chemical indicators, you have 60 seconds to respond. So I would look at, at kind of the three of us as, as your checks and balances. And I think Amy SD 79 does speak to u utilizing everything that you have. So, you know, between legislative, ex executive, and judicial, I I'll take, I guess, executive power up here. But um, I think that with CIs, well, one thing that parametric release doesn't do is it doesn't tell you if a load is, is loaded improperly, if you've stacked sets on top of each other. And yes, you can monitor the parameters of the, you know, the, the steam and the time and the temperature in that load, but you don't know if it's reached inside those sets. And where chemical indicators can provide that value is, you know, you can put the chemical indicator right next to a set or in a set, and it will tell you if the parameters have met or been reached into that particular area. Um, whereas the parametric release really is just telling you that all the stuff inside that sterilizer has been, uh, been run to what you push the button and have it run. So I think that internal indicator is really where you can utilize that uh, that process. So, time's up. Thank you. And parametric release. <laughs> <laughs> parametric release. You now have 60 seconds to reply. As I said before, I I uh, I'm not an advocate against uh, CIs and BIs. I'm an advocate uh, for parametric release. And um, if when I was a CSSD manager, I always said, I don't want to sterilize indicators. I want to sterilize instruments. So I want to know what happens to an instrument. And if I put a, a, a CI in my load or in my tray or in my uh, or BIs in my load, I'm, I'm checking them. I'm not checking the actual instrument. So I think, I think that um, I understand, of course, that, that there are uh, standards in, in other countries, not only in the U.S. And, uh, I've been traveling all around the world, and BIs and CIs are used there often. So uh, I understand that you have to follow your standards. But I would, I would say, please look at other things, too, and, and see if they are applicable to your situation, and you get more data. I want data. I don't want anything else but data, and data I can time, data I can follow up on. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Uh, this question will be directed towards the BI uh, point of view. Many in the industry have questions regarding the risk of over-processing biological indicators in excess of their validated time and or temperature. Are these valid concerns? Why or why not? Three minutes. I definitely would say that these are valid concerns. Um, there's a big disconnect between medical device manufacturers and the manufacturers of sterilizers and sterility assurance products. Um, and these medical device manufacturers are requiring specific cycles sometimes, often with extended exposures or higher temperatures. Um, and we understand that you're having to change sometimes your sterilizers to meet those needs. Um, the problem is that as BI manufacturers, we have to follow the guidance of ST79, as I've mentioned, um, ANSI AMI ISO 11138, and the FDA guidance for 510K submissions of BIs. And that requires that we validate our BIs in commercial sterilizers in manufacturer validated cycles. And so there's a limited number of sterilizer cycles on the market on, at these extended exposures or these higher temperatures. Um, and thus there's a limited number of sterility assurance products. Um, so really, again, as I mentioned before, ST79 says that you should run biological indicators, but that you have to be very sure that you're choosing a biological indicator that's specific for that cycle. Um, I would also say that you would want a different level of challenge or a different level of resistance. Um, if, you know, sterilizer manufacturers use BIs in their half cycle validation testing of their sterilizer cycles. And so if a BI has been deemed adequate to monitor, let's say, a four minute steam cycle, it's probably not an adequate monitor of your 10 minute or your 20 minute steam cycle. 
you really need to evaluate your risk. You really need to look at your loads. You need to look at the, the BI manufacturer's instructions for use along with your sterilizer manufacturer's instructions for use and really try to evaluate the products that are on the market and that are, that are available for some of these specific cycles that you're, um, that you're looking for. But I would, I would argue that, again, one BI SKU may not fit all, and that because a BI was validated for a standard terminal cycle, it may not be appropriate for some of your extended cycles. It may not be appropriate for some of your higher temperatures. Thank you. Chemical indicators, you have 60 seconds to respond. Yeah, and I guess what, what kind of raises the, the question is, is if, if it's a risk to the BI, as far as I know, there are no extended cycle BI packs or there, how do you do every load monitoring if you only have a BI that's been approved for a four minute cycle? So, you know, where I would say is, is really the, the risk is whether you're monitoring the full cycle. If it's an extended cycle of 10 minutes or 20 minutes, uh, the risk is not getting a true measurement of that entire cycle. Um, where I think the, the chemical indicator can step in and where you, you, know, you see that is that those chemical indicators are designed to measure a full cycle, whereas you know, th that's the one limitation to a BI, even though you are measuring a spore, is that it can only measure up to the lethality of that last you know, spore that's in, on that strip. Uh, where chemical indicators can go kind of beyond that to a, a, a negative six early assurance monitoring level. Parametric release, you have 60 seconds to respond. I also think that uh, overexposing, uh, over processing biological indicators is a risk. Um, uh, as I understand, there are specific standards for uh, producing these uh, biological indicators, and they have a specific cycle to, to comply to. Um, in our sterilizer, even a normal cycle, it takes longer than uh, the beer vessel that, uh, that is used to make a, a biological indicator. So I think the risk is really there. Thank you. Uh, biological indicators, you have 60 seconds to rebut. So I do just want to respond and say that there, there is no physical monitor that will monitor all the way out to the end of the cycle. Even a chemical indicator reaches its end point before the end of a cycle. Um, but again, I do want to say at the end of the day, it's really about evaluating what you're running. It's about evaluating your loads. It's about evaluating your needs and seeing what's on the market. Because there are more and more products available on the market today. And there are some reusable devices that will meet your extended cycle needs now on the market today. So I think, again, just take a look at the products that are on the market. Take a look at what your needs are. And just evaluate your risk and make sure that the product that you're using is adequately uh, mitigating those risks. Thank you. This next question will be directed to CIs. Uh, you will have three minutes to re reply. With the push for every load biological monitoring, why would it still be necessary to run chemical indicators at all? So I think we've touched on a little bit of it in the sense that, you know, you, you have to evaluate what your load is. And um, if, you, if you're using a biological in a load, it's not necessarily telling you that the sterility or the sterilization parameters have, have reached the end, the end point, which is a tray or an instrument. Um, and so we use internal indicators. Uh, we can also use process challenge device chemical indicators that do measure. Um, in some cases, if it's a uh, type six process challenge device, it does measure a, a very specific target, which is your, your time and your temperature, and they are uh, designed and set up for a full cycle. Now, they may terminate a few seconds before that cycle, but they do go into measuring uh, with a, especially a type six or um, a type five, which is within about a 15% error, 6% on the class sixes. Uh, you do get to measure more of that load. Uh, the other piece of why you can't just do a load monitor with a biological and be done with chemical indicators is, you know, once that leaves the sterile processing department, you know, the tape or some sort of process device that's on that, on that set is going to tell somebody that, yes, this has been exposed to uh, sterilization. Um, and then once somebody opens that wrap up, they can then monitor has sterilization met in that level. And that's where you're actually going to use that chemical indi indicator you know, once it's leaving the SPD. Thank you. 
parametric release, you have 60 seconds to respond. I have one thing that triggers me. Um, why would you want a chemical indicator to convince the end user that you sterilized your product? Because you have a sterilizer, you have protocols, you have tested it, and now you have to put a chemical indicator of four, if you do orthopedics or you have to do a load of them, and then just to satisfy the end user in the theater that the, the tray was correctly processed. That is, for me, I would not accept that because that is, they, they are questioning my processes, they are questioning my professionalism, and I think that if my process is validated and my cycles are released on parameters, I, I, if, you buy, if you buy anything in the, in, 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 in the shop, uh, there will not be a special indicator telling you that it was processed in the right way. You, you trust your, 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 your manufacturer, and the CSD is a manufacturer in this case. Thank you. Biological indicators, you have 60 seconds to respond. Um, so I think it's, I want to go back to something Michael said because I'm going to steal his term um, because it really is about checks and balances. Um, CIs are the last line of defense in visually determining that your cycle was successful. They're the fastest visual representation of whether your pouches or your trays or your containers saw sterilant. So again, it really is about setting up a quality control system and using all of these monitors in conjunction with each other. So it really is about checks and balances. Um, I think you can build a lot of information about your processes if you're looking at all of these things hand in hand, if you're evaluating your cycle tapes as you run your loads, if you're looking at your CIs and if you're using your BIs to get a lethality measurement, I think you can get a lot of confidence in your practices and you can gain a lot of information about your day-to-day -day risks and your day-to-day -day practices. Thank you. Chemical indicators, you have 60 seconds to rebut. So I agree, again, with the checks of balance. I mean, your first line of defense is checking the sterilizer tape, making sure that the, the parameters have been met. However, you know, yes, you want to trust that everybody is loading that sterilizer correctly, that you don't have any wet packs, that you've basically put everything in there the exact same way the ex every single time. But if you don't have that, you have an indicator at the end of the line that's going to tell you that, hey, it was, you know, these trays were stacked on top of each other, that second level of that tray underneath never got steam, that's, that indicator is going to fail, and that's where you're going to decide, okay, we need to recall that set, and we need to look at our process. So it's, you know, they're not there to, you're not, you're not saying we've, we've I, I always say this, just because you have a, a passing indicator doesn't necessarily mean that the instrument next to it is sterile but it, it's at least an indicator that gives you a pretty good idea that it is. Thank you. Yes, thank you, panelists. Uh, this will begin our rapid fire question section. We will ask a single question. Uh, each panelist will be given 60 seconds to respond to that question. After the final panelist has answered, each panelist will then be given 60 seconds to rebut uh, the previous arguments. Uh, our first question uh, will begin with biological indicators. Uh, and the question is, does your sterility assurance method save facilities money as compared to the alternatives? Um, I would think, I don't know if compared to the alternatives, but I would think so. Um, BI monitoring is often necessary for passing inspections for Medicare and Medicaid reimbursements and other state regulations. Um, and again, BI products on the market are so fast today. Um, you can keep your high throughput processing of your loads. Um, it limits your response time. It limits the resources that you need. Um, we don't want anything bad to happen, but in the event of a load recall, it can really limit your response time in the, in the event of a load recall. Um, BIs are validated for sterilizer qualifications and cycle qualifications, so it can give you good information on your equipment maintenance and um, limit your response time in case of an equipment downtime. Um, and we are also dedicated to developing products that have a smaller footprint on the, you know, a small footprint on the environment and our landfills, and it ultimately benefits you. It ultimately results in lower disposal costs. Thank you. Same question, chemical indicators, you have 60 seconds. 
again, I mean, it's compared, okay, I think it's gonna be less expensive to do parametric release, it's gonna be more expensive to do biological monitoring, and then chemical indicators is probably gonna fall in the middle. But I think at the end of the day, um, you know, when we, especially when we start going to every load monitoring and, and that becomes an expensive thing when you're using a BI pack in every single load. Um, you know, and I think with more and more people going to instrument tracking services and, and instrument tracking uh, software, there's ways that you can, I think the big scare is that if you put an implant load in and you forget to put a BI in because you used a chemical indicator pack, um, I think that there are some ways that you can be creative with instrument tracking systems that won't allow it to, to proceed without using the correct process challenge device. If there's an implant, use a BI. If there's a non-implant, you can use a PCD and save your, uh, save your hospital some money uh, by also following the AME guidelines of a non-implant load. Thank you. Same question, parametric release, 60 seconds. This one is easy. Um, <laughs> Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, if you do parametric release, you will not use chemical indicators or biological indicators, so you save that. Um, you need a chemical indicator on the outside of the pack to, to show that it's been processed properly. Um, but um, you do need to do some validation. So you do need to spend some money on proper validation, thermal mapping of your loads. So that's something you cannot do without. So that will cost money, but uh, 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 on the other hand, uh, you don't need to have record keeping, you don't need to have special storage for your, uh, for your indicators. Uh, that's all gone. Thank you. Uh, biological indicators, you have 60 seconds to rebut. Um. Again, I think it's about really evaluating the risk benefit at the end of the day. Um, take a look at your day-to-day -day risks, um, what's necessary to mitigate those risks, and what's the benefit of you know, the lower cost in not using these items versus the risk. Um, I think in a lot of cases you'll find that by adopting adopting every load monitoring, um, that the confidence that you're going to have in your processes and your individual cycles is going to well outweigh um, the cost. Thank you. Chemical indicators, you have 60 seconds to rebut. Yeah, I mean, again, it did, the, the, the question becomes, do you run a BI in every load and then do you spend that money? Or where you don't have the requirements or the need to do that, can you run a chemical indicator that costs, you know, half the amount of money? Um, and, you know, do you have, if the requirements are an, an implant load or, or once daily, uh, you know, it, it starts to become expensive for people to go from running it once a day to uh, how many times? I mean, I've talked to a number of SPD managers that say, you know, when's the last time you had a failed biological? And so do you go back and because you had one failed biological four years ago that ended up being a, maybe even a user error where they read it wrong or the incubator gave out a false positive, do you now jump into running it in every single load? So I think, again, it's, it, it, you know, I'll say measure what your facility needs. If you feel like your staff needs the assurance of having a BI in every load, that's what you're gonna do. Otherwise, you can use a chemical indicator. Thank you. Parametric release, 60 seconds to rebut. It's, of course, difficult for me to, uh, to say something about the common practices and, uh, and uh, the requirements in, in the U.S., but if you look at, at Europe, we do it this way. And um, we don't see uh, uh, serious uh, outbreaks, if that's an indicator. Um, but what we, uh, 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 what we do see is that we, we spend a lot of time evaluating the individual instruments for sterilization. So you need, you need to know what you're doing. You need to know what you're putting in your sterilizer. And we worry more about that than about a chemical or a biological indicator. Thank you. And our next question will be directed to parametric release. Why is your method the preferred method for load recall situations? You have 60 seconds to respond. If you have the proper um, uh, measuring devices in place in your sterilizer, 
and you are sure that your steam conditions are as they should be, then every uh, deviation from those parameters will be seen on your sterilizer or on the data provided by your sterilizer, and you can do an immediate recall. You don't have to wait for anything, and you do that based on data. Thank you. Chemical indicators, you have 60 seconds to respond. Yeah, I think that chemical indicators also provide an instant instant feedback because once you pull that out of the sterilizer, uh, you're going to be able to read on the chemical indicator card whether it's been positive or negative. Um, you know, I think we all probably have had situations where uh, our steam quality has changed. You will show up one morning and they've blown out the uh, boiler and now all of a sudden the steam's changed in that sterilizer. Um, you run a Bowie Dick and you determine that it has a leak. Um, so I think that it gives you instant feedback uh, so that hopefully you alleviate any recall situations down the road um, if you're waiting for a biological result. Thank you. Biological indicators, you have 60 seconds to respond. Um, I would say that BIs are the best way because you get a true biological response, right? I mean, the, the products on the market today are, again, very fast. And so a lot of times you can get a response before an adverse event has even had a chance to occur. And again, this is a true biological response. It's a measure of how lethal your cycle was. Um, Imagine if you do every load BI monitoring in the event of a load recall, how quickly you could isolate that load if you have a BI in every single load. Um, the limited number of resources you would have to devote to that load recall, the, the limited amount of time you would have to devote to that, um, even in, even in follow-up. Um, so again, I believe every load monitoring feasibly allows you um, to get a direct measure of lethality in a very fast time, um, again, often before an adverse event can even occur. Thank you. Parametric release, you have 60 seconds to rebut. I can understand that uh, if you have a, a color change or anything, any changes in a chemical indicator or you incubate a, a biological, you, you, you will get some information. Um, I question the, uh, uh, the validity of those results in relation to the actual instruments. So if you, if you don't do proper validation of your, of your uh, loads and you don't know the parameters, I think the, uh, uh, the, the information received from chemical or, or biological um, is not 100% objective. Thank you. Chemical indicators, you have 60 seconds to rebut. I guess, because I think, Kelly, you get to rebut this, so I'll give you <laughs> your last word, but I guess one question I have is if it's a true biological readout, most of the BIs, especially the ones that are probably most prominent, uh, prominently used, are a, a rapid readout based on an enzymatic prediction. So it's not necessarily getting a true biological read uh, in, you know, unless you grow it out for 24 hours. So you are waiting for an extended period of time. So that would be my question as far as running a BI in every load, but releasing it in 24 minutes, an hour, whatever it is, based on a prediction uh, rather than the true biological readout, whereas a chemical indicator is measuring a specific event uh, based on the scientific change of color of that ink. Thank you. Biological indicators, you have 60 seconds to rebut. All right, well, you're making me skip ahead, but I'll allow it. Um, <laughs> so he's right. Most of the BIs on the market today are early read BIs. They're enzyme-based BIs. Um, but this enzyme is native to the organism. So you can be, number one, confident that you're getting a true biological response from that test organism, and it's number two been correlated to the organism growth. So a lot of validation work has been done on these early readout BIs. So there is no reason to grow them out for 24 hours because that early response that you're getting from the incubator has been validated and correlated to the organism growth. Thank you. Our next rapid fire question is there are different global standards and recommendations for sterility assurance. Set those aside for a moment and speak to the scientific arguments for your utilizing your method of sterility assurance as opposed to the other methods represented on this panel. Chemical indicators, you have 60 seconds to respond. So I'm gonna try and, and speak to ster the sterility assurance 
uh, level the curve, if anybody's familiar with that, I'm gonna try and condense this into probably now 50 seconds because I'm setting it up. So when you have a spore, you've got a million spores in, in a bio self-contained biological, and you're measuring that to the final lethal lethality of that one last spore that's in there. So that's a, basically a 10 to the six, whereas some of the chemical indicators that I'm gonna speak specifically to the type sixes that we can utilize <laughs> takes it twice as far into minus six of that Sterling assurance curve. So, um, so really, you know, what I look at is, is it's, it's a scientific way that it's, it specifically is looking at a full cycle that takes you to two times, what we would call two times BI kill, where, you know, it's just, it's just the limitation of a BI. It cannot measure beyond its, its death. So the chemical indicator can actually measure beyond that point, and you know that uh, you've, you've reached the assur Sterling assurance level of 10 to the minus six as opposed to uh, six reduction of, of a million spores. Thank you. Biological indicators, same question, 60 seconds. Um, okay. So first, I'm just, I, I want to start by saying um, I take issue with, I guess, the way the question is worded a little bit in terms of answering, because I'm not arguing to use biological indicators in, um, as opposed to chemical indicators. BIs are not meant to be used alone. They're meant to be used as part of a quality control system of sterility assurance. So they're really meant to be an additional monitor in addition to your other physical monitors, in addition to your chemical indicators. Um, Again, I, I've talked about it earlier. Bacterial spores are already genetically predisposed to survive some of the most harsh, non-life-sustaining conditions on the planet. Um, and ISO 17665 states that we have to provide a 10 to the minus 6 sterility assurance level in our bi biological indicators. That means a 1 in 1 million chance of that spores, of a spore surviving. And so that's a 1 in 1 million chance of the most resistant organism for that sterilization process surviving. You can be pretty confident that you're not going to have those, those spore forming organisms at that population on your devices. Thank you. Same question, parametric release. The science behind uh, steam sterilization, as I mentioned before, is a specific temperature for a specific time in the presence of saturated steam uh, at the instrument level. So time and temperature you can measure. Um, and uh, the, the wild card here is uh, uh, the steam quality and the steam uh, saturation. I know there are countries who said how much steam saturation there should be. There is nobody, almost nobody in the world who can measure that on a daily or load basis. So if you can, if you're able to do that, to measure the sterilant steam, the, the, the saturation of the steam, you can measure the time, you can measure the, the, um, the temperature, and you do that on an instrument level, then you've got real science. And you do it for the actual products that you sterilize. Thank you. Chemical indicators, you have 60 seconds to rebut. So to, to kind of expand on that, you know, with chemical indicators, and primarily uh, if you look at, there are some out there that, that do measure steam. And uh, specifically, if you've, if you've seen uh, a purple to ink technology, where it, or purple to green ink technology, it basically starts as one chemistry. And it's, uh, it's, um, Basically, once there is a steam molecule present, it changes the color. And that's, that's the only way that it'll change the color, is in the presence of steam. So if you put those in a set, you can measure that it's reached that steam level. Now it takes time, and it takes the temperature, and then it takes the presence of steam. And that's why, as you start getting into different types, those type sixes and some type fives uh, that do have that technology can measure all three of those things, including the sterilant, in this case being steam. Thank you. Biological indicators, you have 60 seconds to rebut. Um, I just wanted to reiterate, that because we'd been talking a lot about the early read BIs, that again, these have been correlated, um, the early read from the incubator has been correlated to ends, um, organism survival and growth. So you can be confident in these early read products that you are getting a true biological response and a true measure of the lethality of your cycle. Thank you. Uh, parametric, you have 60 seconds to rebut. Um, I think that um, um, if you want to, to sterilize medical instruments, uh, medical devices, you have to measure the medical device and not an indicator. Thank you. This next question will begin our wild card questions. 
The wild card questions were submitted by each panelist directed to another panelist. And the questions will begin now. The first question is, if a negative BI does not prove that all items in the load are sterile or that they were all exposed to adequate sterilization conditions according to ST79, what is the true value for sterility assurance? And this question was asked by parametric release to biological indicators and you have 60 seconds to reply. Um, so I would argue that none of these modalities can really ensure the sterility of every device in your load. And it's impractical for us to think that we can test every single device in a load. Um, a biological indicator is a tool. It's meant to demonstrate that the conditions within your sterilizer cycle were adequate to kill a, highly, a high number of highly resistant spores. Um, sorry, I lost my, lost my train of thought. Um, But BI sterilizer monitoring, um, it also, it's, there's, a, there's an assumption in that statement um, because it also assumes that every other part of ANSI Amy ST79 has been followed. Um, that's a really large guidance document. There's a lot of steps to ensuring that that device is ready for terminal sterilization, whether it's manual processing or washing, soil removal, um, some things that other panelists have touched on. The loads need to be prepared properly. The sterilizer needs to be loaded properly. Um, these are all things that have to be taken into account and have to be done appropriately according to ST79 for that biological indicator response to be an adequate response. Thank you. Chemical indicators, you have 60 seconds to rebut. Yeah, I think that there is a need for a, a load release of some sort. So, um, you know, you want to measure it beyond just, uh, just making sure that the sterilizer met its parameters because, you know, we don't have one standard load. How do you know that for that load, the operator chose the correct load. How do you know that the load was loaded correctly? How do you know that uh, steam was able to reach in between and, and around everything that was loaded in that sterilizer? So I think that there is a need for uh, some sort of a PCD, whether that's a biological uh, or a chemical, chemical indicator and how you follow the ANSI guidelines. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I think, again, you know, yes, we're, we're testing instruments, but. I don't know if that parametric release can actually pull an instrument and say, I've tested that instrument uh, if it's been loaded improperly. So, you know, I think the closest thing you can get is to either mimicking a wrap set with a process challenge device, whether that's a biological or a chemical indicator, or uh, actually having something as close to that instrument as you can as a, with an internal chemical indicator. Thank you. Parametric release, you have 60 seconds to rebut. The um, uh, uh, and a, a good example of this is uh, I saw in, in the AMI standard that FACO handpieces need to be sterilized in a vertical position. Um, you can put chemical indicators in, you can put biological indicators in, it will not mimic the specific conditions of a specific instrument. These uh, conditions were found by doing parametric release, by doing validation of these specific instruments, and now also in the U.S., there is a recommendation to sterilize these things in a vertical position and not flat in the tray because of the design of the instrument. So the design of the instrument and the position of the instrument is also important. So you put, you put a, a biological in, and uh, ST79 uh, uh, says even, even if it's negative, there is no proof that it is sterile. So I think that uh, that is something that uh, speaks for uh, parametric release. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from uh, the biological position uh, and is directed towards parametric release. With the wide variability in sterilization loads and conditions across different facilities, can parametric release alone ensure the lethality of a sterilization cycle when no biological monitor is present? You have 60 seconds. Yes. Um, the reason for that is that you need to validate. You need to validate your load in your instrument and the, the specific instruments that, that are processed in your, uh, in your sterilizer. Of course, you need also need to monitor the steam, the steam from the hospital, the steam quality, the steam production, the non-condensable gases. You have to measure all the parameters. 
and then you know that you can reproduce this. This is also done in pharmacy. They do the same thing. You, you and even in, in, in uh, um, commercial sterilization. So if you, if you understand these things, then you, yes, you can say every load is sterile. Of course, if you have a new loading pattern, you need to revalidate. If you have new instruments, you need to revalidate. But what if you same, use the same biological indicator, it might be uh, a pass even with new instruments. So I think that you should always do parametric release. Thank you. Chemical indicators, you have 60 seconds to rebut. I think that when you're talking about validating a cycle or you're looking at using parametric release that yeah, when you set up a validation, you're paying attention to all those things. I think in the practical world, when you've got, you know, three different shifts throughout the day, you've got, you know, new staff coming in every other week, um, you've got a hectic or chaotic uh, surgery day where people are coming and screaming at you to get this set up right away. And so all of a sudden, that, that particular set that was supposed to go into this particular uh, case, there's this, or this sterilization load, now has to be moved over into this one. So now you've changed all the parameters of that validated cycle because you've had to shift for various things throughout the day. So I think, again, I mean, you want to obviously me measure uh, the parameters of sterilization, but, you know, again, everything kind of comes back to the safety, kind of the safety net of having a BI or CI uh, for those different types of scenarios that you know, I don't think we all probably have had the same day over and over again in, in sterile, monitor, sterile process monitoring. Thank you. Biological indicators, you have 60 seconds to rebut. Well, and just to sort of add to that, you know, again, we've been talking about a quality control system and we've been talking about the checks and balances. So where are the checks and balances to the parametric release then to show that that validation work has been done properly, to show that all of the, the um, activities that were found during the validation work are being followed and being put into practice? And so, I, again, I would, I would just encourage you to really think about those things and think about those checks and balances and think, think about the way these things can work together to really ensure your result. Thank you. Our next question was submitted by chemical indicators directed to biological indicators. If Geobacillus sterothermophilus has a kill time of two minutes in a standard 132 Celsius degree sterilization cycle, and the minimum acceptable time for sterilization is four minutes, can a BI with a PCD effectively test the sterilization cycle beyond the initial two minutes of any cycle? You have 60 seconds to reply. I mean, I would say yes, that it can. I mean, it's looking for catastrophic equipment failures. It's, it's still looking for failures in your sterilization cycle. Um, it's a balance, right? We, we have a, a tough job as manufacturers. We have to meet the, the needs of that four minute cycle, but we have to be able to produce a consistent product that works across a variety of facility conditions. You know, we've talked about steam quality and water quality. Different types of equipment can operate differently. And so it is a little bit of a balance, but I think this is a great question because I think it really leads to what I've been asking you to think about, which is that one BI SKU may not fit all, and maybe not in, in the way he intended the question, but I really want you to think about your immediate use cycles and your extended cycles and whether that four minute indicators and an appropriate monitor of some of those cycles. Thank you. Parametric release, you have 60 seconds to rebut. Um, I also saw that, that uh, the, um, uh, the way that the, the biologicals are tested is a bit different than the real life uh, um, situation. And I understand now, because I'm not familiar with all the different types of biologicals, that you have specific biologicals for specific cycles. That is fine. But is that all? That's the exposure time. But what does it say about the load? How does the load affect the biological? I, I wonder if that, if that is even possible, that a, that a load, loading pattern or the weight of a load can have an effect on a biological. Thank you. Chemical indicators, you have 60 seconds to rebut. Yeah, and I, I think, again, it, to me, it comes down to when you're looking at measuring um, 
you're measuring an entire load. So if you're looking at parametric release, you're looking for it to have reached that cycle time, whether it's four minutes, eight minutes, 18 minutes. Um, if you're looking for it to reach a certain temperature for that time, that it's reached all of its uh, you know, vacuums and, and, and pressures and steam and all that stuff. Where the, where the, I think that the biggest limitation with the biological, and I think it's probably one of the only ones, is that it stops measuring after it's been killed in two minutes. So, you know, when you look at, at everything that's available to you, most biological PCDs have a chemical indicator in them as well. Um, so you're using both. But I think that you can select a PCD that's specific to uh, the cycle, whether it's a, a four minute, eight minute, 18 minute, 20 minute. Hopefully, hopefully we start getting down to a couple standard cycles and we can kind of stop having this debate, but <laughs> um, we're here now. Thank you. Thank you. We will now have questions from the audience that were submitted to our Twitter account. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so we have a lot of questions, actually, for parametric release. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so the first one here, how does parametric monitoring guarantee that that steam has reached all levels in a pack or container? By validation. So uh, you have a standard way of packing and uh, or packing wrapping material or a container and uh, you have your, your instrument trays, you put them in your, in your wrap and you put your thermocouples inside the pack and you measure on and in instruments if the sterilization conditions are met. So it's not outside, it's not next to it, it's on the actual instrument. Okay, thank you. Another question for parametric release. What is the scientific research that has been done in regards to parametric release in Europe? Is it as safe as BIs and CIs? There is a lot of research because um, uh, um, every sterilizer installed in Europe has to be validated. And validation means parametrically released. So that means that you have to have a, you have an IQ, OQ, PQ, and the PQ in the hospital is a validation. The thermal mapping of that specific cycle and all the cycles that are used in that specific hospital. So they're not, the initial could not be all the initial cycles installed by the manufacturer of the sterilizer, but you measure uh, uh, the conditions inside the hospital, uh, the specific conditions, because they can have a different water temperature, a different water quality. They can have all kinds of uh, deviations inside there, because every hospital is different. And then uh, you, um, uh, with the scientific data that we have, uh, First of all, you have to have tight tests, that's uh, part of the scientific data, but then all the validation reports from all these different customers, and then that's your scientific data. And from our company, we already have other scientific data on the, the measuring of the saturation of the steam. We have a special device, but that's maybe a little too early to introduce here. Is parametric monitoring a separate device from the sterilizer? Mm. Okay. I, no. Um, on every sterilizer also here in the U.S., you have your temperature gauges, you have your temperature uh, probes, and everything is in place. So you can use that. They need to be calibrated, and then you can use them. Uh, the only thing we cannot measure now is uh, the saturation of the steam. Uh, that means that everybody now is doing uh, um, the pressure and the time. Uh, on, uh, on, on uh, the pressure and the temperature of the steam, and you say, okay, it's saturated or not. But 100% saturation is not possible because there is always non-condensable gases in, in the thing. So what happens is that you, you can put in a uh, process challenge device uh, that can be fitted with a biological indicator or a chemical indicator or electronic. Um, and, uh, of course, you can do validation that means put real thermocouples connected to a computer and measure the actual temperature inside an instrument. 
And then you can find out, like I said about the FACOs, that the FACO is such a small instrument, you, you would think it's not an issue, but it fills up with condensate, and you will not have steam penetration anymore. And if you put it vertically, then you can, you have steam, it will drain and you will have steam penetration. So there can be, we've got hundreds, maybe thousands of these instruments with lumens. And they need to be, the, the, the air need to be out and the steam needs to get in and not blocked by water. So you need, you need to test that. And it cannot be tested in another way than measuring. Thank you. Uh, we have about five more minutes here for Q&A before we move to the summary. Are there any audience questions? I can hand you the mic. Hi, my name's Kim. Um, first, thank you. This is, this is fantastic. Uh, and this topic is not the first or the only difference between Europe and America. But I was curious from a historical perspective, um, for both Europe and America, did the construction of sterilizers drive how we validate them? Or did our desire to validate a certain way drive the constructions of the sterilizers? Good question. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm the only one here. Take Come on. Uh, Mike, do you want to start? You can start, Mike, then we'll just go down the line. Um, I, I mean, I, I would, without honestly knowing the exact answer to your question, I would say we're, you know, sterilizers have been around for a long time and we've developed ways to, to validate and to check them, um, especially from a chemical indicators. You know, you, you know, we know that sterilization happens at a certain point. Of, of time and temperature and at the presence of a sterilant. And so as we start looking at how do we measure that, that's a constant. I mean, even some of the wicking and migrating indicators goes back to, you know, some old old days of putting some lead in a, in a beaker and letting it melt down till that's the point where you felt an instrument held over heat could be sterile. So, um, you know, I, I would say that the, the, probably the sterilizer drove how we measure and validate it as opposed kind of going the other direction. But there may be some ways that, you know, we're, we're trying to change, you know, adding, um, adding a printer to a sterilizer wasn't there before. So we've probably done both to where you now have a printout so that you can have record of that validation. Thank you, Renee. I think the, the curiosity of the end user changed everything. And you, you, in, the, in the past, you had a sterilizer. I'm aware that uh, in, in, uh, in many parts in the world, you use uh, uh, steam from uh, the hospital, created somewhere else. The moment you start to measure things and start to evaluate things, there are hardly any sterilizers in my country, or there are non, no sterilizers in, in my country that don't use dedicated steam generators per sterilizer. Fed with RO, with the mineralized water. That, that comes from measuring. You, you, you put something in the sterilizer, you measure something, and then you realize, oh, I need to change something. The other thing is that, um, um, and I'm not, that maybe may sound strange, but I'm not a big fan of standards. You know, the, you know who writes standards, these international standards? ISO and whatever, manufacturers. You, you don't write them, the manufacturers do. And well, how do they write them? To sell the equipment. Might sound strange, I'm a manufacturer too, but um, um, if, you, if you start, uh, you know, uh, I have to be careful now. Um, <laughs> um, too late for that. I have <laughs> Um, um, uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is that if you, if you put in a, there is a company and a, oh, come on, no, I'm sorry, I'll stop, <laughs> this, this, this is not good. Uh, but I, I, think, I think the curiosity made everything uh, uh, change. Otherwise you would still have your own, uh, ge no generator steam coming from the hospital and uh, the indicators will be still the 24-hour uh, biologicals, and everybody wants something. So innovation is driven by curiosity. 
All right, thank you. Kelly, did you have a comment? Yeah, I agree. I don't have a whole lot to add to that, but I agree that the sterilizers are definitely driving the need for these products. And, you know, they started out with um, spore strips in glassine envelopes, and we're moving to self-contained biological indicators with, you know, response times in under an hour. So um, I, I agree with the other panelists. All right, so we have time for one more question. Uh, thank you. This question's, uh, uh, again, kind of around parametric release. Just um, unfortunately, as an end user in the operating room, uh, there are times uh, based on uh, whatever flaws in the process that there are items that make it there that did not go through a sterilization cycle and that CI or the, the indicator tape is useful for the end user to see at a visual glance whether or not that um, item had been sterilized. Uh, so in a parametric uh, release scenario, how, what is the indicator for the operating room uh, staff to know that that item went through the, through the sterilization cycle? Are you, are you telling me you got products that were not sterilized at all? Right. And why was that? Sorry, I'm not touching a topic that is probably uh, uh, because um, another thing that we do in Europe is we all have double door sterilizers, just like you have double door pass through washers. If you have a single door sterilizer, uh, you will you you have a risk. Your loading door is your unloading site. You have a risk that you've got non not sterilized products out. You can always make that mistake. Um, if you don't, if you don't have that, then you have a one-way street from decontam to the unloading side or the sterile side of your sterilizer. Then there is no risk, and then you don't need your chemical indicator. Yeah, the chemical indicator is on the outside, eh? but the door only opens when the cycle was completed. When the cycle has, has aborted or it was not sterilized at all, it says on the packing side. I, it is simple as that. And, and I understand, if you have single doors, maybe you need chemical or biological indicators. But I, but I really can't understand, as an ex-CSSD manager, why don't you put pass-through sterilizers in your department? That, it's fail-safe. Come on, it's, it's the easiest thing to do. Sorry to be European. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> well, uh, this we have time now for uh, summary statements, brief summary statements from each of the positions. Uh, as we close, I'd like to speak for uh, Bob and myself as the moderators and say thank you for your engagement and thank you for your time and attention and being here. Uh, summary statements, we'll just go down the line and start with Mike. So uh, I think at the end of the day, we've used the term checks and balances and I think we need to evaluate and be educated and use all the information we have with all the products we have uh, to know that if one fails, you have another one there that can kind of back it up. Um, if, if parametric release, the, the ticket, the operator read it, they thought it, it reached all its parameters, and then it gets sent up, you know, or pulls the load out. You've seen the biological result. You know, maybe it catches it there. If it misses there, now you have a, an internal indicator that can go up into the OR where it at least gives an indication that it's been exposed to the process. Um, is there anything that's going to tell you exactly that the fourth instrument on the third level tray in a set that was sterilized in the middle of the sterilizer is validated at a, at a sterilization? There, there isn't that answer, but we have what we have, and I think understanding the differences in products and how they can work together uh, to create that checks and balances is kind of the important thing to consider, um, knowing that there are so many cycles and there are so many products that can do different things. Um, you know, really do a job of understanding what they do and what they're challenging so that when you use it, you know what it's testing and you know if there's a failure, why there's a failure, uh, and what you can start to go do to, to, I guess, trace where that came from. Thank you. Uh, Renee? Uh, first of all, I want to say I'm not against biological or chemical indicators. Um, um, I'm in favor of something else. And that something else doesn't exclude the other two. Then the other two are, are additional. But I think the primary thing what you should do is to know what happens in, every, in the load. Not 
beside the load or somewhere else or whatever. So I think I think that um, uh, for, for many years ago, Europe was also in the same position, and we were driven by curious people, people who said, I want to push the boundaries. I don't want to do what, if, what we've been doing for all these years. And we, we, are, we, are, we are not sterilizing forks and knives anymore. We are sterilizing medical devices, super complex, robotic instruments, very complex laparoscopic instruments. These are challenges to our processes, and even if we need to change the process, you still need to do the measurement and not rely on the same uh, indicator or biological indicator or chemical indicator that you used yesterday. So you need to evolve, constantly grow and grow your knowledge and grow your understanding, and then also um, uh, uh, get the science of steam sterilization. It looks very simple. I said it in the beginning. It's just take the air out, put some steam in, heat it up, done. It's not as simple as that. There are many factors uh, uh, that um, uh, could have a negative effect on, on your products, and the only way to, to know them is to get data. <coughs> data, data, data. And, and, and do an evaluation of the data, and then maybe change the process. Maybe don't change the process. But I am sure I can change the process without having any change on a chemical indicator or a biological indicator and have a major change on my sterilization assurance. Thank you. Uh, lastly, we'll pass it off to Kelly and then we'll go to Justin for just some concluding comments. All right. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank everybody for letting me be here and for giving us this opportunity to interact. Um, when I came to Cirrus, I thought I knew a lot about bacteria. And then I started working with these biological um, indicator organisms and realized I still had a lot to learn. And I think that's kind of the goal, right? That's kind of why we're all here, because we have a lot to learn from each other. And it starts with understanding each other's limitations and it starts with understanding each other's needs. Um, and we want to be able to help you guys meet your needs. We, we want to be able to help you mitigate your risks from day to day. We, we know how much is expected of you um, and we know how fast paced your world is. We really do. Um, and so we want to be able to continue to provide better and better products for you. Um, and again, that helps, um, or that starts with communication. It starts with us learning from each other. Um, so just, again, thank you so much for allowing us to be here. All right, everyone. Thank you for attending the Beyond Clean Myth Busting panel discussion, our second straight here at the 2019 Isham Annual Conference and Expo. Once again, we'd like to thank everyone, uh, especially our past guests that are in attendance tonight, um, and extend our warmest appreciation to the sponsors who have helped make this project possible over the last 18 months. Beyond Clean is committed to serving as the central nexus for the people and processes and products that are driving the industry forward and taking us beyond clean. We hope that you will continue to support our efforts and join us as we fight dirty. Have a great evening. Thank you.